I, I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to be fair? It's like musical pizza. Hi, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yes? No? Should I talk? Okay, good. Excellent. Uh, my name is Jen Northington, and I'm the events director for Book Riot and Riot New Media Group. And I just want to say how wonderful it is to see all of your lovely bookish faces here tonight. Um, it's been a really intense week, and uh, we're really delighted that you all still came out to be part of this event. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I also want to thank The Strand for being such a wonderful event partner and host and for providing the $15 gift cards that you guys have um, if you buy your ticket. So yes, you should use those to buy a book, maybe one of tonight's author's books, I'm just saying. Um, those books are on a table towards the back, and there's a register up towards the very back, or the front if you came in that way, um, where you can buy them. So yes, definitely think about that. I also want to thank tonight's sponsor, which is Unbound World who bring us the best of science fiction, or fantasy, weird fiction, and more at unboundworlds.com. You should give them a look. Um, and I think most of you know this already, but just to say it again, Phoebe Robinson's filming schedule changed, which is one of the hazards of being as amazing as she is. And so she is no longer able to be here tonight. Um, but we're still going to talk about her book because we love it so much, and we're still going to support it. And while I am not even close to being a sufficient substitute, I will read a little bit from it so that we still get a taste of her book tonight. Uh, so um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to turn it over to our MC for the evening, who is also a certified sommelier and the author of this calls for a drink. Her name is Diane McMartin. She picked out the wines and the pairings, and she's going to tell you a little bit about why she picked the wines that she did for pairing with our author's books. Um, and then they're going to read a little bit, and then we'll have some Q&A and a signing. So please give a round of applause for Diane McMartin. Hi, guys. Well, one thing that's a first for me tonight, I've never done an event where I didn't have to open all the wine. Usually I'm like back there like sweating with a corkscrew and I'm like, oh, do I still look okay? So that was really cool. I feel really fancy. Um, so as Jen said, um, I'm the author of This Calls for a Drink and it's a book that's all about how to pair uh, wine and beer with kind of different moments in your life. Um, so there is a little bit in there about, um, you know, what to drink with different things that you might be reading. But, you know, of course, there's all kinds of other life events like, you know, getting dumped or your best friend getting married or, you know, all kinds of other things. And so when you write on a topic like this, you know, all your friends and family, they kind of start throwing out a bunch of like weird ideas like what should you pair with kayaking or you know like skydiving or bungee jumping I'm like guys not everything calls for a drink. Some things you should maybe drink after. Like, you know, you shouldn't operate heavy machinery. Like, let's let's try to keep it reasonable. So when I was approached about doing this event, I thought it was a really fun idea because books are something that's a really natural pairing with having a delicious adult beverage. And after this week, I think we all need a drink, right? Can, yeah. Okay. It's been a little. It's been a little rough. Um, you know. So reading is something that you know. Uh, whether you're on your couch or you know in the bathtub, like I am, I do most of my best reading there. Um, having a drink along with what you're reading can really make it a little bit more fun. So I thought it was a really great idea uh, to you know pair different beverages with um, some of these great books that we're going to get a little taste of tonight. Um, so each one of the each one of the wines that I chose this evening, um, kind of. Of, to me, I, I really want. I wanted to choose something that I thought would be fun to read, to drink while you were reading that book. Um, so you can kind of imagine as you sip all of these wines and you know take a look at them. Kind of imagine how they would fit into you know reading that book and what that experience would be like. Um, so you know I kind of wanted something a little bit dark and brooding um, for Aize's book, and so I chose a, a really delicious ten-year tawny port. Um, I wanted something that was, you know, kind of like frothy and fun and, you know, and, and goes with kind of like a, you know, something fun and funny um, for Phoebe's book, but that's also serious and well made. So I chose um, a sparkling uh, rose uh, from Burgundy for that. Um, we have a lovely kind of crisp, refreshing Shoy Reba from Germany to pair with Alyssa's book. Um, and then we have a really delicious Zinfandel to pair with Tara Clancy's memoir. So I hope that you guys um, enjoy all of these pairings and enjoy hearing a little bit from all of these authors. So we're going to start with Alyssa. Um, and for Alyssa Cole's um, 
For Alyssa Cole's book, I chose uh, a wine that's called Shoy Reba. Um, Shoy Reba, Reba is a kind of a, a Riesling hybrid. It was a cross um, that somebody in Germany decided to make to sort of get the most out of uh, all the beautiful aromas and flavors that Riesling has, but make it like a little bit easier to grow. Um, so that was kind of where that grape came from. But it's this kind of like light, um, refreshing, delicious wine. If you like Sauvignon Blanc, it's something that you would probably really like. Um, but Alyssa's book is a kind of Book that I would want to just like curl up and devour all at once, like in one sitting. So I kind of wanted to pair something with it that was, you know, a little light, a little easy drinking, something that can maybe take you through like a few hours and, you know, wouldn't have you falling asleep after a couple of chapters. So that was kind of the reason that I chose that. So I'm going to turn it over to you and. Uh... <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I've been traveling since like 6 a.m., so <laughs> out of it right now. Um, so I'm reading from the last book in my post-apocalyptic trilogy. Uh, it's called the Off the Grid Trilogy. Um, this book is, uh, since it's the, the last book, it's basically the book where things are starting to recover, in the world, uh, there was an event. And the first book, basically, there's an event, and no one knows what happened. The second book is people going out to figure out what happened. And in this book, it's set a few years after. Um, I'm going to spoil something. The event was a solar flare. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know that for this to make sense. Um, so, and this book features the youngest uh, sister in the, fam the family featured in the trilogy. And she is going to um, basically, it's post-apocalyptic post new adult romance. New adult romance is basically like going to school, going to college romance. So um, <laughs> this is basically uh, the world is trying to get back on its feet. And one of the things that has happened is um, they're starting college programs for people who were, you know, had their lives disrupted by the world almost ending. <laughs> You know, she's gotten her GED and she's going off to school and is, of course, going with um, her older brother's hot friend who she has a crush on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the book is fun. There are a lot of fun. I like to balance the fun with the darkness. It's like, well, half the world's population has died, but also, you know, there's good stuff going on too. <laughs> um, this part isn't this part itself isn't particularly fun, unfortunately. But you know, hopefully you enjoy it. Um at this point she is driving to toward uh upstate New York with her Edwin, who is her crush. And they are they are rolling up to a police blockade. Which is obviously if you've read any post apocalyptic anything, you know police blockades are not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. So the car rolled to a stop and one of the officers approached. Good afternoon, good afternoon, officer, Edwin said. Is there a problem? The man looked wiry, but Edwin's conciliatory behavior seemed to loosen some of the stiffness in his shoulders. He approached the window but stayed far enough away that he wasn't a threat or so that he could get out of the way if Edwin was. Sorry, sir, miss. We received a tip that there's been some neolithite activity in the area. Given the proximity to the power plant and the new electrical grid setup, we're trying to be careful. I work for the Department of Infrastructure Repair, so I'm definitely not trying to take everyone back to the dark ages, Edwin said. I'm going to reach for my ID now. He slowly retrieved the plastic rectangle from his wallet, then held it up, but didn't pass it over. The officer seemed to understand his reticence. Edwin turned the ID back and forth to display the holographic insignia that was supposed to prove its veracity. Thank you, sir. The officer gave a respectful nod, then turned to his partner. They're cool. Let them through. As we drove away, I checked the two men in my side view mirror. They leaned back against their cop car and chatted, waiting for the next car to come through. Do you think they're legit? I asked. Only now that we'd passed them did the goosebumps raise on my arms. There had obviously been crime before, but society had operated on an unspoken system of trust. And that trust had been backed up by decades of social norms and, ev and eventually the ability to look someone up online and see whether they were lying or not. The flare had interrupted all that. 
anyone could claim to be anything, and the only way to know whether you were being conned was to have a good gut instinct and, failing that, quick reflexes. Edwin shrugged, glancing in, glanced in the rearview mirror. Yeah, I've been getting updates from the department all week. Apparently, they caught some assholes trying to break into one of the recently opened plants. Their plan was to burn the place. And they were serious? Doubt was the first emotion my mind would allow entry to, although fear pushed at the floodgates. I didn't want to believe such a thing was true. Are you sure this wasn't like one of those situations like the last time when it turned out the guy was some weirdo who said he wanted to blow up a power plant but didn't actually have the means to do it? A random guy with destructive thoughts was better than a coordinated plan of attack. No, this was the real deal, Edwin replied, dashing my hopes. Government intelligence agencies have been picking up a lot of buzz on the wires. These groups are scattered around the country, but they've started interacting with each other, making plans. I can't imagine, I said. Fear had finally gotten through, crawling over my skin like the ants that invaded the house every spring. If they'd succeeded, it would have been a huge setback, really huge. Edwin's jaw was a tense line. We're just eking by what the equipment needed to rebuild, even with people working around the clock. They had to beg and scrape and improvise like motherfuckers to get that place up and running. My parents are nodding. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I knew from John that the hardest part of the rebuilding was getting the right parts for the electrical grids. Electricity was needed for large-scale manufacturing. There weren't any artisanal electron electrical transformer markets around, creating a post-apocalyptic catch-22. I don't get it, I said. Do they not remember what we, that we need electricity for clean water? Do they, do they want to go back to shitting in the woods? Maybe they should do a poll before acting on everyone's behalf. Who wants to keep the internet? I raised my hand and waved it around. <laughs> Some people think the flare was a judgment from God, or that we need to go back to basics so the next natural disaster won't wipe us out, Edwin said. People need something to believe in, and a random burst of solar energy is something that you can't fight with guns or fists. For the zealots, this is a way of controlling things. Um, I hooked the thumb under my seva and pulled it away from me. If people want to live like that, it's fine. Why do they care what everyone else does? There are plenty of places that won't be on the grid for years, decades even. They can move there. Edwin lifted his shoulder as if he didn't know, but he still spoke. I guess I get it in a way. Think about all the stuff that was going on before the flare. Global warming, war, cyberbullying, uh, governmental abuse of power. To them, this is our chance to start over and do things right. Why do they get to decide what's right for everyone else? I asked. Why not, he said the words easily, like he wasn't advocating for a bunch of people who wanted to finish off what the flare had started. I flushed it. I flipped the chest strap of the seatbelt behind my back so I could lean closer to him, because I don't want to live like that, and they don't want to live like us. Can you put your seatbelt back on? Flying through the window for an accident won't make your argument stronger. <laughs> I, flipped back, I slipped back through the strap and dropped into my seat and huffed. I don't understand why you're defending them. Please don't tell me you're one of those guys who thinks he has to play devil's advocate in every, conver in every conversation because that's a highly unattractive trait. <laughs> <laughs> he sighed, something he had done a lot over the last few hours. I seem to have that effect on people. I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying that people do things they'd never imagined in the name of trying to survive. I've done things I'm not proud of, but if you asked me back then, I could justify my actions in a heartbeat. I thought I was doing what was best for everyone, but really I was doing what was best for myself. Thank you, that was awesome. So has anybody, has anybody had the short yerba yet? The white that's kind of in the long skinny bottle? What would you guys think, who liked it? Did anybody not like it? I didn't make it, so I won't be <laughs> insulted. <laughs> um, Cool, I'm glad you guys enjoyed that, and that was a great reading, and I think kind of uh, apropos, so, you know, good, <laughs> good choice there. Um, so, for our, so for our next reading, um, we're gonna have a little bit from Aize's book, The Liminal People, which I really loved. Um, I loved the kind of like, I don't know, dark, brooding tone to the whole book. I was telling him earlier, I don't know if this is like a nerdy thing to say, but the whole time I just kept thinking, this has to be a movie. 
because it would be <laughs> such a rad movie. Um, but you know, it's a book that has you know this kind of like kind of a dark tone to it, and it also has a lot, one of the big themes that I noticed reading it was kind of transformation and becoming something else. So I wanted to choose a wine that you know packed a little bit of a punch because Taggart's kind of a tough guy, um, but also you know something like Tawny Port, which starts out as kind of a normal red table wine and is transformed by aging in oak barrels for years and years and being fortified into something really, really different. Um, so that was one of the reasons that I chose that. So I hope that everybody is sipping on it tonight. It's kind of a chilly night, so it's, it's a good night for port. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying that. And uh, let's have a little reading. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, this is the wrong room for me to be reading in because there's like so many good books in here. <laughs> I feel like Richard Price is like looking at me from down there. And I'm, like, you're going to screw this up. So, um, I also, uh, I'm from New York originally, but I, uh, I live in California now. And uh, I was like, oh, New York has changed so much. And then I couldn't get a cab to <laughs> stop to pick me up. And I was like, no, it's the same. same. <laughs> Same, same, same spot. So forgive me if I'm a little off. <clears throat> um, so this is from my first book, The Liminal People. Uh, what you need to know is that there is um, a guy named Taggart, and he can heal people. The, the line that everybody loves is that he can, <laughs> he can heal people the way pretentious New Yorkers read The New Yorker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he can like read people's bodies and do things to them. Um, his girlfriend called him a freak and told him to go away, and so he did. And this is sort of about what happens when he went away. And maybe I'll read a little bit about um, his boss. <clears throat> I met this kid once. Uh, he was maybe 12 years old. His dad owned the biggest telecommunications network in Mogadishu. Don't laugh, those Africans will kill for wireless, literally. The kid was like me, only he talked to the land. Once his hands were in the dirt, he could make things grow, enrich soil, deplete it, whatever he wanted. After I showed him what I could do, we became friends. I asked him one time if he ever wanted to get out of the Mog, and he told me even if his father would let him, he wouldn't leave. I will die without this land. He said this land, like he was talking about the plot directly below him. I was still kind of fucked up at that time over Yasmin, so I just chatted it, chalked it up to his youth, some kid not wanting to have new experiences of the world. But now, as I'm sitting on this plane, leaving Africa for the first time in five years under my real name, I'm realizing how much I had in common with that kid. I'm afraid I'm going to die on this little journey and never come back. It's the never coming back part that's hitting me more than the dying. After Yasmin wrote me off, I went on this ironic death journey around the world, trying to save as many lives as I could. I didn't put myself in danger's way. I pulled up a chair in front of death TV and started on a bowl of cocoa crisp like it was Saturday morning and I was a kid again. And I was a kid again. At first I went through the official channel. Somewhere I think I even have my Red Cross jacket. Whenever medics are being fired upon, that's where I went. And once there, I broke the rules and went into the no-fly zones. Shit, if suicide by terrorist bullet didn't get me, this trip shouldn't be so hard. Strange that it feels the same. When Yasmin left, I was alone again. My parents and I had worked out a nonverbal agreement. They would pay for college and never mention my brother or the house that I destroyed that they had to sell, so long as I never came home or asked them for anything. Even after she left, I always filled out Yasmin's name and address in the place marked for next of kin. Working my trick on a young village boy or girl torn up by automatic fire as bullets whiz by me, and all I could think about is what Yasmin was going to do when she finds herself the proud owner of my headless corpse. It never happened. <laughs> I can't say a full few bullets didn't catch me or that my ambulance never hit a stray landmine, but my body has this automatic healing effect. It's, it's automatic. Hell, happens even faster when I black out. It only took four fatal gunshot wounds to realize that. And I couldn't even get drunk enough to mourn my inability to commit suicide. My body wouldn't let me. So instead, I got immoral. Turns out an EMT is like a street doctor for those who can't afford a hospital visit. As I, was about to go back to, as I was about to go back to London from Sri Lanka, an African with a British accent approached me about doing some field work on the continent. He was looking for a field-trained medic unafraid of bullets, and he definitely paid more than the Red Cross. 
So to Somalia I went, working for a warlord. I ordered enough supplies I didn't need to make sure, and made sure not to heal anyone too quickly. Still, I got a reputation for, me, for being able to handle almost anything after the warlord got cancer in his foot, and I saved him without chemo. You'd think he'd be appreciative. Instead, the bastard started renting me out, first to a Liberian friend of his, and to, then to some Colombians he knew. But the cash was good, and I was treated like a king. I liked the life and would have stayed if not for the mother who brought her daughter to me one night, begging that I heal her. The girl was less than nine years old and had more herpes sores covering her hairless vagina than zits covering her face. The mother pleaded with me to heal her as she was my warlord's favorite and he didn't know that the mother had been renting the girl out to other people. I healed the girl in silence. No tricks, no fake medication, no examination. I just laid my hands on the sides of her head and spit my rage on every cell of that virus in her body. The sores fell off literally and I fell off the planet. I'm not going to say I was innocent back then, but I knew less of what people were willing to live with, to put up with, to invite, in order to survive. I had seen babies turned out as prostitutes before, of course. I'd seen them ravaged by STIs. Yeah, most definitely. Had I seen creatures disguised as mothers pimping their kids out previous to that? Yes. But to see it all together, at once, staring at me with hopeful eyes, filled with understanding, inviting me to join their compromised way of life, it was too much for a younger version of me to bear. How was I to know I was just delaying the inevitable? I figured someone would come for me. I couldn't just walk out of the Moog, but that's what I did. Out of Mogadishu, into Kenya, up to Ethiopia, then across the Sudan, Chad, and the Niger. My dark skin helped me blend in. Anyone who came at me with guns, I healed. When I needed shelter, I healed people for it. The same with food. There are a lot of sick people in Africa. I became a bit of a legend. I never spoke to anyone and never rested more than a day in any place. It took me a year and a half, but I walked from Mogadishu to Bandagada, Mali. Why there? No idea. The place pulled me to it. The people there, the Dogon, they're the only ones that reacted to, my, reacted to my healing with absolutely no surprise. I stayed among them for a month, learning their language, helping them find a way to eke out a survival in the poorest country in the world, crying about all I had seen before they kicked me out. Healers are a poison to the warrior's soul, the village chiefs told me. They make us forget the gift of death. This is a hard land, and we must be hard to survive. You are a good man, but you make us soft. Where do you go when dirt farmers don't want you? Make a little more. You are a king playing the role of visor to sycophants and insignificance were the first words my boss said to me. They were coughed out between battles against rising sputum, sometimes settling in a draw. Behind me, a host of loyal murderers sat outside the door. I felt most of their pulses rise, their throats close, their jaws clench as we set about entering the room and approached the small sand igloo that the man rested in. As usual, he was covered in blankets and shadows. I made out two eyes perched immediately over a pit of darkness all a child's height above the ground, but nothing else. I'd ne I've never met anyone I couldn't feel before. Still haven't, though I'm sure the others out there. At the time, it was the first confirmed surprise regarding my powers I'd experienced. Nordine had no heartbeat, no pulse, no respiratory functions, or even digestive systems that I could feel. Every time those deep yellow orbs that he called eyes blinked, I was surprised. That's probably why it took me a few minutes to respond to his critique of my life. Why king? I finally attempted in English, realizing I couldn't recall what language he had spoken to me in. Why not God? At best, you might become a proper tuner of a God machine, little healer, he responded in English after a laugh that frightened me more than I thought possible. But your providence is what? Bodies? Flesh? Perhaps time, even? The gods are beyond such things. I'm barely understanding what you're saying. Are you like me? You are barely visible as one of my kin, little healer. Don't presume too much. There was spittle in his voice that brightened the room as he spoke. It came to me that the other stayed out of the room, not out of deference to me, but to him. That the fates make your talent so capricious is your only value. You know what I can do? Do you know? I asked you earlier. Do you work all flesh, animal, fish, and fowl? Is your trick limited to the body, or do you see the mind and spirit as well? How do you heal? 
Do you reverse the ravages of time, or do you connect with the eternal vision that is the ideal flesh and return it to that monstrously stagnant vision? Speak quickly and know that I cannot be lied to. It was the only hint he ever gave me of his own abilities. I told him about everything, about my powers, though I left out the part about my brother and my time in London. As soon as he said it, I believe he could tell if I was lying. I banked on omission, not being considered lies, but there was enough in my initial diatribe to make my soon-to-be master slash boss content. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was like that was one of my favorite passages. I'm so glad that you chose that. I hope everybody's enjoying the port. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about Phoebe Robinson's "You Can't Touch My Hair," um, which is an awesome kind of collection of essays. And one of the things that I love about it so much is that I love it when an, a writer can talk about things that are really important and serious, but also make them fun and you know have us all laugh at the same time. Um, and I always like it when wines can do that too. I think sometimes the wine world can get like a little serious and pretentious. I don't know if anybody's picked up a copy of Wine Spectator lately, but it's like a little, let's calm down, guys. So I always really, I like it when wines can be really well made and made by somebody who's serious about what they're doing, but they're fun to drink, and you don't have to care about all of that to enjoy them. So, and if you're a fan of Two Dope Queens, which I definitely am, you know that Phoebe and Jessica love rosé. It's a lifestyle. So... I I wanted to choose, um, so I wanted to choose a uh, rosé to go with her book. So I chose this great sparkling rosé from Burgundy. It's from um, a producer that specializes in Chablis, which is kind of like uh, less oaky Chardonnay um, from northern France, but he also makes this really fun um, sparkling uh, rosé from Pinot Noir. So it's made by a really serious winemaker, but it's something that is fun to drink as well. So I thought that that would be a really good choice to go along with Phoebe's book. So I think Jen is going to come up here and read a little bit from it. There you are. All right. I clearly cannot do it justice, but I, I wanted to still, we really love her and her book. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is just read some from the introduction, which is longer than I remember it being. So we'll see how much I do. OK. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> Introduction from Phoebe Robinson's You Can't Touch My Hair, which is great. The other day, I was thinking about the first time someone of a different race gave me a lady boner. I, I, I signed up for this. Just, just bear with me. <laughs> it was more than 17 years ago, February 24th, 1999 to be exact, and I was watching the Grammys. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself during this time. I was a 14-year-old movie nerd and an everything school-related slacker. I'd often referred to myself as a tomboy until I learned that liking and watching sports but not actually being good at them does not make you a tomboy, it makes you a human. <laughs> so yes, I was a 14-year-old sports and movie-loving person slash nerd who thought that watching award shows was the bomb.tumblr.com, probably because I'd never won anything. So seeing people at the height of their artistic achievements was the ultimate fantasy land for me. I cried along with Hilary Swank as she graciously accepted a Best Actress Oscar for her performance in Boys Don't Cry. I pretended I was up there with Lauren Hill when she did a touching and intimate rendition of To Zion right before snagging a Grammy for Album of the Year. And I laughed when ac Italian actor Roberto Benigni Memba him, who was so overjoyed at winning the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film that he walked on the back of people's seats to get to the stage. Award shows gave me hope that maybe I would also do something equally impressive with my life, that I could have a future outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Nothing against the Cleve, but I just had a feeling something cool outside those city limits awaited me. Watching these award shows was my, my way of preparing for my future successes, I told myself, and was way more interesting than, say, studying for chemistry class. And in my eyes, there was truly no greater award show than the 1999 Grammys. During this golden age of pop culture achievements, Hill was the belle of the ball, Madonna was killing it in her ray of light earth mother phase, and Will Smith won best rap solo performance for getting jiggy with it. <laughs> Oh, I remember that. I know. Looking back on it now, it's kind of ridic.edu that out of all the songs nominated, including Hill's Lost Ones and Jay-Z's Hard Knock Life Ghetto Anthem, that Smith won Best Rap Solo Performance. But the 90s were full of bad choices, OK? Like, guys in boy bands wearing golf visors when they weren't golfing. 
the movie Battlefield Earth, <laughs> Lou Bega and his Mambo Number no. 5 bullshit, Pizza Bagels, The Gulf War, Utah point, Jazz point guard John Stockton wearing short shorts on the basketball court, and me spending three weeks trying to memorize the lyrics to Bare Naked Ladies one week. After those 21 days, all I got down was Chickity China, the Chinese chicken. <laughs> Three weeks, guys, that's all I got. The point is, in the 90s, mistakes were made. Lessons were learned, and thanks to Ricky Martin's The Cup of Life performance at the 1999 Grammys, I learned that my vagine is capable of quaking over non-black dudes the way the glass of water did in Jurassic Park when dinosaurs were nearby. And I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> By the book. <laughs> All right, has anybody had some rosé yet? All right, what do you guys think? You like it? Awesome. All right, so for our last wine and reading pairing, uh, we're going to have a little Zinfandel. Um, so Zin this is a Zinfandel from uh, Dry Creek Valley in California from um, Dash Cellars. They're one of my favorite producers of Zinfandel. Um, and I thought the cool thing about Zinfandel is that um, just like part of Tara Clancy's family, um, Zinfandel comes from Italy, um, but it has become something that is uniquely American. Um, so it used to be called Primitivo uh, when it was grown in Italy. And before that, it was a grape that was from grown in Croatia called Kajernak Kastelanski. I always get that wrong. I think I was like close. I was like 80% there with that. Um, so it's a grape that has a really interesting history, but it's kind of like America's grape now. Um, so it's also something that I think if you were, you know, going to be at a really big family dinner with lots of delicious food, which, you know, you hear that described in her memoir a lot. Um, this is a kind of like, you know, softer, easier drinking red that you could really, you could have with that. And that would also be great to just, you know, sip reading her book, although I will say I actually listened to her read most of it, and if you haven't heard the audio book version of her book, it is fantastic, and it's even better, I think, than actually reading it. So we're going to get to hear a little bit of Tara now. Hi, how are you? You good? Yeah. All right, um, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to take this, I don't know, let's do this. What? Now I'm gonna take it out. All right, um, since I'm the last one of the night, you know what, um, I'm not gonna read from the book. Surprise! Um, <laughs> here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, so I, I tell stories on The Moth, I host The Moth, and everybody knows The Moth on NPR? Okay. Uh, so I just figured I would, I would tell a little bit of a story about why I wrote the book um, instead. All right, you game, you good? Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> So I am I, seven, eight years old, maybe, and I am standing inside the refrigerator door. And I am pretending to look for something to eat, um, but what I am actually doing uh, is eavesdropping, right? But I got to keep up the con, right? So I'm like... I'm like shuffling around like the mayo and like, you know, the mustard and the ketchup. I'm like sort of like playing, you know, three card Monty with the condiments, right? Uh, and I'm like covered, I've been there for so long, I'm so desperate to stay that like my arms are covered in goosebumps and my legs are covered in goosebumps. And so now I'm using my goosebumped arms to rub my goosebumped legs. And I am so desperate to stay inside uh, because on the other side of the refrigerator door, it is summertime in Queens. And that means that my father and my uncles are sitting around the kitchen table and they are telling stories. And they are the like really raunchy, good stories that kids are not supposed to hear, right? And they're sitting around and it's like they've got the, you know, the little tiny kitchen table and there's like the overstuffed ashtray and the splayed box of donuts and the like mounting pyramid of empty beer cans. And I inevitably this time, like every other time that I have pulled this con, because I like to pull that con a lot, uh, I get caught. My father's like, hey, here's the rustling behind the door. You. <laughs> out of here. These stories aren't for young ears. And I get kicked out of the kitchen. Flash forward. Two decades, yeah, two decades later. 
by pure chance, I am given a copy of Richard Price's first book, The Wanderers. Anybody familiar with The Wanderers, his first book? <laughs> okay. Basically, it's sort of partially, it's his very first novel, partially autobiographical, working class guys in the 60s in the Bronx. Uh, I read this book, and it is like getting to hear the stories of my father and my uncles. And I am like no more than 20 pages in, and I am transported right back to the inside of that refrigerator door. Only this time, I get to stay. Now, as struck as I was by what was in that book, I was equally struck by what was not in that book. And that is the voices of working class women in New York. And so I took my copy of The Wanderers and I walked into a bookstore and I held it up for a guy and I said, hey, I basically want this book, but by a woman. The guy, the clerk just kind of froze, and I could see his wheels turning, and then he went, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't exist. And then me and this dude start to like just brainstorm together. All right, what was the last book? What's a comparable book written by a working class woman in New York City? What's a comparable book? And we're both sitting there and we're trying to brainstorm. And we're getting people, people in the bookstore are coming over and we're all like, oh, what could it be, what could it be? And we're going and we're going and we're going. Anybody? Uh, basically what this entire group of people come up with is that the last book written by a working class New York woman about us was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, Amazing book, <laughs> but it was published exactly 73 years ago. 73 years. That's more than my mother's lifetime. That's tragic. <laughs> That's bullshit. Okay. So I walk out of the store, and I am, I, I'm, I'm like bonkers. I have go around, and I tell this fact to everybody I know, and I am by no means this really well-read person. And I'm like, somebody's going to come up with something better. Somebody's going to have another idea. And I tell everybody and everybody, and I, I start like making this joke. I'm like, well, who's going to do it? I'm like, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to write this book. I'm like, you know what? And I'm as a bartender at the time. I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to call it A Tree Grew in Brooklyn a long fucking time ago. And then that joke kind of became like a mantra. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I am not going to let a measly thing like not having a writing degree <laughs> or much experience or possibly any talent get in my way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so here it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, obviously, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna like, I, I really am not gonna read it. I, I just, you know, uh, I, I, I think we're just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of leave it. I'm gonna leave it at that. I mean, I can tell you just this really quick little summation of, of, of what it is. Generally what it is, because this is what matters. What matters is it's the first portrait of working class women in New York City in 73 fucking years. Do you need to know any more? Because you should read it. Um, <laughs> Uh, essentially, my life was a little bit split. My mom is, it was Italian, and hence, hence the Italian wine pairing. My mom is, is Mella Riccobono, she, and I grew up with the sort of, in Brooklyn, these Italian Riccobono family, and then the Irish, my dad's Irish family, which is the Clancy's. Uh, and so my life was kind of split between those two families, my, my family in that way. And then there's this third sliver of my life that's like as radically different as you can imagine of two working class families in Queens. Like, is absolutely like the a complete and total opposite but if I tell you why or how I had this weird third sliver of my life you know you wouldn't buy the book so <laughs> I'm gonna just I'm just gonna leave it at that thank you very much
try to fix this for you now. I, I messed it up. There you go. It. Okay. There you go. Oh, there it is. All right. Okay. Um, so did everybody try a little bit of Zinfandel? Oh, I think I'm getting like weird echoes. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much to our authors for reading and uh, Jen for standing in for Phoebe Robinson. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed all of the wines that we chose tonight. There's looks like there's plenty more back there. So, um, you know, please feel free to um, drink up and enjoy and, you know, ask us all questions and... Should we do a little q and A? I I feel like maybe we should, yeah, okay, I'm just getting nods. Um, so let's do a little Q&A. Uh, and uh, so the authors are gonna stay up here, you're gonna ask them some questions, and then we'll drink whatever wine is left and you'll buy books and have them signed. Okay, that's the plan. Who's got the first question? Yes. Of course I read my own. <laughs> <laughs> Who else but Penny Marshall was too busy? <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to the next question and answer so everybody can hear. Uh, who's got another question? Anybody? Yes, no? Yeah. This is a general question, I think, for all of you. Um, where did you write? Oh, oh. Like physically? Yeah. Um, well, you know, people always ask me, you know, because I write about wine and beer, if I, you know, like, oh, what do you drink while you're writing? And the boring answer is like water or coffee. <laughs> so I actually do most of my writing at my favorite neighborhood coffee shop. I live in Northern Virginia. Um, it's kind of like my second office, and I'm afraid sometimes that they think that maybe I don't have any place else to go because I tend to go there first thing in the morning and I look a little bit disheveled. But yeah, I do most of my writing. I can't really do it in my house. I get too like antsy and start looking at laundry and like you know thinking of other things I should be doing so yeah I really like the you know I'm one of those annoying pretentious people sitting in a coffee shop like at my laptop writing so that's my that's my boring answer um, <laughs> I don't know you gotta teach me how to do this um, I wrote it at my best friend's house Katie right there I wrote it yeah she let me stay on our couch. Um, I wrote it in Morocco, I wrote it in Mexico, I wrote it in Malaysia, I wrote it um, in Ethiopia, um, I wrote it in my house. I, when I sit down, I write. That's kind of what, it, just, I just keep writing. Sorry. <laughs> um, so for, from the book, I read from, generally I write at home. Um, I like writing in bed, it's, I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> my last bed uh, before I got married had an indent from where I would just sit <laughs> and write. Um, I mean, I walk, you know, when I lived in New York, you have to walk too. But on um, this book, I wrote it in, Mar I live in Martinique now, um, which sounds awesome, except there are no, there aren't like Starbucks and coffee shops and places to go, to go write. So I just write in my office alone, like a sad person. <laughs> Um, I, I write mostly while driving. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I, ha I, I have to write at home because I, I like to specifically try to write in my, in my voice. Um, so I have to, I speak sentences aloud. Like if some, if there's some pretty prose, I'm like, eh, you know, um, I cut it. My editor loves that. She's like, it was gorgeous. I'm like, out, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that aloud. Uh, so I, I have to also write at home. Any more questions? <laughs> Anybody? Yes? Okay. To the microphone. So you just mentioned that you have to write in your own voice. How do you find your characters' voices? And how do you stay in that space? Oh, nice. <laughs> that's how you gonna do me? Okay. Um, I think um, there I think that's the work. You know, and I think part of it is what you said. I, I say everything out loud. I've read that book. I've read every book out loud about five times. Um, sometimes I've recorded myself and played it back. Um, I listen to, I give my books to about four or five other people before my publisher um, gets, a, uh, editor gets a look at it and they tell me what sounds off or whatever. Um, but I really focus on language, um, sentence structure, um, I teach high school English, so that helps. But um, it's really about like just really being honest with um, you know, like I don't. I'm ruthless. Like if I if it doesn't work, I'm like nope. Do I like what I do is I write everything out, like every 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 possible thing, 
And then um, I just cut like a vicious savage and just like murder things. And then that one right there, the other Katie, she looks at it and she goes, your grammar is so screwed up. You need so much help. And then she like fixes it for me. So <laughs> that's what happens. Um, for this series, um, this series is the only series that I've written in first person, um, which was fun, but also weird because it was, you know, it's easy to slip more of yourself into the story when you're writing in first person. But it was also kind of fun because each book, um, it's from a perspec the perspective of a different character. Uh, the first two books are to the two best friends and them having their own adventure. And the fun thing to do with um, this book, which is Maggie, she's the youngest and she's grown up basically in a cabin just with her family and her friends. And so it was trying to give her her own voice, but also to add, uh, to be aware of the fact that a lot of her own, at the beginning at least, a lot of her voice would be the voice of the other characters because those were the things that she was exposed to. Like there was no internet or TV or things like that. So um, that kind of stuff is fun to think of and finding the voice for the characters, what their influences are. Sochi? How do I answer questions about characters? They're, they're called my grandmother. That's it. They're, I don't have to make her up. I mean, yeah, I get to bring her back to life. You know, that's that's it. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for being here. This was really fun. This is a really cool idea. I was wondering if you were all going to choose your own pairing for your book, what would you choose? Diane, like, cover your ears. Don't listen. <laughs> I mean, it's funny to have a book about working class queens, like, paired with a wine nobody in my family's ever heard of. <laughs> I had to say, I loved that. Um, so, yeah, if it was me, it'd be like, Budweiser. <laughs> They'd all have nice wine, and mine would be Bud in a little pretty glass. Um, mine probably would have been moonshine or like something brewed in a garbage bag or yeah. something. <laughs> but I don't think you guys would really want to drink that. <laughs> yeah, mine would probably be some skunky mezcal that you can only find like once a year in some weird town in Mexico that you have to pay somebody like 40 pesos for. So yeah. Hmm. That's a really, that's a tough question. Um, but you know, my, my answer to any wine pairing question, like when I'm kind of stuck or you know, when, you're, when I'm not sure what to pair with something, it's pretty much always champagne. Bubbles go with everything. So yeah, I, yeah, so that's, that would be my pairing. The best champagne you can afford. Somebody else is buying. <laughs> Thank you again for all coming out. And let's give them one more round of applause.